Hello everyone. This is Emily Bick from Rainbow Tree Care Scientific Advancements. Today I'm going to be talking about scale insects, biology translated to management. Uh, first a little bit about myself. I am a board certified entomologist. I actually have a degree from Cornell University in entomology. I currently work and have been working for the last almost two years now as a research and development project manager at Rainbow Tree Care Scientific. So I take a look at the insect needs of Rainbow and of our clients, and I try and take a look at that uh, biology and translate, it, translate that into management strategies. First, a little housekeeping. This webinar is worth one CEU. Um, if you did not enter in your ISA certification number during the registration, you can actually just enter it into the question box right now to get CEUs. If you have any questions during, uh, during the talk, just also just answer, uh, enter them into the question box, and we can address them during the webinar. I have Peter on hand here to answer some of the questions that pop up. Some of the harder ones I'll actually just address at the end of the webinar. Um, also, this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be available afterwards. I think it's, it'll be posted to the website on Friday. So first I want to go over just the intended outcomes of this talk. Uh, we'd like to explain the basic understanding of scale insects, take a look at their biology, take a look at the major group of scale insects that arborists encounter, uh, determine why morphology matters, because it really matters in terms of control options, and then just go over the basics of scale management for practitioners. Um, at the very end of the slide, or at the end of this talk, I will have all my contact information noted, so please feel free to call or talk to me um, or email with any follow-up questions. So first, what are scale insects? Uh, scale insects are actually this tiny scale-looking things on leaf tissue that ants are probing. They're important to the ecosystem, and they actually fulfill multiple, multiple niches. Um, we've been using them for various means since ancient times. Um, they are an important coloring agent, and there's a soft scale that grew on cactus plants uh, that was actually taken off. It was prickly pear cactus plants was taken off and used as red natural coloring dye um, that was later imported to, from the Americas to Spain and eventually took over all of Europe. In fact, it's been used for thousands of years as dye, and that's just one of the ecological niches of these scale insects. Today it's even used in cosmetics and food plants, and Starbucks got in trouble a couple of years ago um, for having their uh, red red color, I think, in some of their lattes be attributed to these insects. But really, what are scales? They fall, like all insects, into the kingdom Animalia and the phylum Arthropoda. Uh, the class is technically Insecta, and for scale insects, the order is hemi Hemiptera, which is important because all Hemipterans have piercing, sucking mouth parts, which is how they damage the plant. Um, they do fall into a suborder and a superfamily. So they don't actually fall into the class of leafhoppers and mealybugs and true bugs and cicadas, but they're actually closer related to aphids and indulgids and white flies, um, which means their management techniques are also close, more closely related to the aphids, indulgids, and the white flies. There are 48 families of known scale insects, and if you take a look to the left and the right, their morphology is, is pretty different. It's pretty drastic doesn't really look like any other insects out there. Um, however, there are two majorly important families to practitioners. Uh, soft scales, which are in the family Coccidae, uh, are soft and they're actually, you can tell if they're alive or dead by physically squishing them in your hand and seeing residue or seeing dried, dryness, or uh, dispidae, which are hard armored scales, which actually have a physical covering on top of them that you can remove and find the protected scale insect. And that morphology actually majorly impacts how we can manage the scale insect. Uh, but first, a little bit of general background. Uh, as I said before, they're part of the family Hemipterans, which means that they've got piercing, sucking mouth parts. That's actually the main, uh, main relationship to that family, the main factor that defines these. So piercing, sucking mouth parts actually they can pierce cells directly, um, and 
these, like other insects, uh, exist on the bark, on the leaf, um, on the petiole tissue. Uh, scale insects are highly modified. Uh, the adult females usually lack wings, legs, or even segmentation. So all of the typical identifiers that allow you to say this is definitively an insect, which are wings, legs, or segmentation, are actually just missing in most scale insects. So that means for the practitioners that your clients will likely not recognize this insect as an insect. They say, they might say, hey look, there's this weird growth on my plant. And by that point, it might actually be too late to treat or too late to actually do something about it because of the highly modified nature of the scale insects. Um, as I said before, there's soft scales and armored scales. So uh, soft scales are actually more susceptible to insecticides based on where they feed and the fact that they don't have that outer protective waxy layered covering that armored scales have. And all of this is highly important to how we deal with scale insect issues. But what's the real impact on plants? Um, well, there's the aesthetic appeal. Some scale insects call this, cause a stifling effect, as you can see um, on the bottom right, right of the slide over here. And some actually cause a full leaf dieback, as you can see sort of on the top right. Uh, they do decrease the photosynthetic activity um, in high enough rates that can actually kill trees and kill woody ornamentals. Um, they do allow for more susceptible transmission of pathogens, so that's a major one. So beech bark scale actually, without it, beech bark disease cannot accurately or cannot actively penetrate the bark of the plant. Um, this transmission of pathogens and actually a decrease in photosynthetic activity may cause economic losses, which could be as, as large as the entire tree coming down. Um, and then another major issue with scale insects is honeydew. And honeydew is a sticky residue that's actually streamlined through the scale's body and pushed out the other end. And this is basically the accumulation of sugars that the scale insect cannot physically digest. Um, these only occur in soft scales, so that's a really good way of telling whether you have a, a soft scale or a hard scale on your hands. But many people underestimate the impact of honeydew. Uh, to the left over here, we can see a plant with honeydew on it. So, so basically, this uh, sweet, sticky uh, fluid over here that can actually vector or can actually host this problem called sooty mold. Sooty mold is the black stuff that you see on plants sometimes. Um, if you've ever seen an infested European elm tree, um, the entire bark of the tree under all the foliage is black, when typically is a much lighter color. So it can cause discoloration in the plant. It can cause, but it can also cause other major nuisances. Honeydew and then the black city mold, mold that follows can drip onto cars, can drip onto furniture. I think you actually need a special cleaner to get honeydew off of pan, uh, patio furniture. So it's a major, major nuisance to some homeowners. Um, Additionally, it can also ca uh, cause unwanted pests to come into your backyard or into your client's backyard. Honeydew attracts other insects like wasps and ants, um, which will come for the honeydew and stay and be a general nuisance to the homeowner. Um, but let's back it up a little bit. Let's talk about soft scales, which are one of the two major families that we'll be talking about today. Um, soft scales are recognizable. They're a little bit larger than hard scales, up to a fourth inch in uh, diameter. They are smoother cottony, so they don't physically have that shell. Um, typically, they're round, but they may be covered in a waxy substrate, um, so a, sort of a cottony substrate, as you can see on the bottom right picture over here. They feed directly on the flow of sap, which means, which is why they actually produce that and excrete that sticky honeydew. Um, they do produce a lot of eggs. Uh, but generally only in one generation per year. So one single female can produce up to hundreds to thousands of eggs. But because they do have only that one generation per year, they're actually easier to target and easier to control um, because you can just knock down that stage, that, that stage of generation. And then most overwinter is nymphs, which means that well, when you're thinking about what management strategies and you're at a particularly hard scale year, and you weren't actually able to control it that year, 
because they overwinter as nymphs, you can apply a dormant oil uh, during the winter or right before spring hits and try and knock out that generation. But let's see how scales actually damage the plant. Uh, this slide, and actually the next slide on hard scales, is courtesy of Dr. Joe Boggs of the Ohio State. Uh, so this is a soft scale. It comes uh, to the leaf tissue over here. It physically inserts its mouth, its piercing sucking mouth parts, which are called the stylet, the, the phloem bundle. So directly where nutrients is being, water is being passed up through and sugars are being passed around the plant. Um, it physically damages those, producing the full leaf dieback symptoms. Um, not just the stifling effect seen in hard scales, but it physically kills the, scale, the cells that are above the phloem bundle, as well as will reduce nutrients to the entire leaf. Um, and because it withdraws a large quantity of liquids, uh, there is a, a waste disposal dilemma that we're going to show in this picture over here. Um, so because it's directly tapped into the entire transportation system of the tree. It does actually produce that excess waste in the form of sticky honeydew. And then that sticky honeydew, as we just talked about, causes black sooty mold. Um, however, armored scales have a little bit different uh, mechanism over here. They're a bit smaller, so up to an eighth of an inch long, maybe even smaller than that, which means they're hard to see. And it's actually hard to tell when they're out and about, unless they're in very, very large quantities. They have a waxy shell, which actually per allows protection from some contact insecticides and means that you really have to get the target life stage uh, and really hit that target life stage so it's not protected by that shell. They do not produce honey honeydew, but they can cause some major damage to the plant. Uh, most, most life stages are not mobile, so they are easily targeted once you do find them. Um, and though it's le they produce less than 100 eggs per insect, they're generally more generations, several generations per year. And these ones overwinter as nymphs and adults. So horticulture oils and knockdown sprays won't uh, completely knock out this pest. Now armored scales feed in, in a little bit of a different way. Um, there are our armored scales. This is the leaf cross section over here. And they, instead of uh, hitting the phloem and xylem bundle, the vascular bundle directly, they insert the piercing sucking mouth parts directly into the plant cells, sucking them dry, which will actually damage the cell and produce full leaf symptoms and cause that stifling effect, as you can see over here. Uh, so if you, if you see that type of damage, armored scales or hard scales may be one of the major culprits over there. However, scales are pretty, pretty tiny insects and sometimes don't cause the damage that people attribute to them. So it really leaves it up to the practitioner to determine, do we treat or do we not treat? Uh, many scales are secondary pests and can flourish when the tree is already wounded. Um, by secondary, I mean they come in after the tree is already damaged and they just help finish that tree off. Um, many scale insects are just aesthetic pests. Um, so when you spray them and you still see that scale insect because they stay attached to the surface of the tree, um, that aesthetic damage might not go anywhere. And many actually cause light infestations. Um, so you really, as a practitioner, have to determine, is this economically injuring my plant? What's the sensitivity of the homeowner to this infestation? Um, and how, how much do we have to treat preventatively to, to stop that economic damage to the tree? On the flip side, heavy infestations can cause major plant damage. Uh, you can see wilting, you can see dieback potentially, sometimes even tree death if it's treated or if, it's, if the scale infestation lasts multiple years. You may even see stunting and chlorosis and definitely you'll see reduced vigor in those heavy infestations. Uh, also, sooty mold is not just unsightly, but can be a major challenge to get off of patio furniture and cars, all that. And then, as well as pathogen susceptibility, where if you have a major scale infestation, and that tree is now much more susceptible to pathogens that it wouldn't necessarily be susceptible to before. 
So when you're thinking about treatment, and you're thinking, do I treat, do I not treat, you've made the decision, okay, it's time to treat, you really have to take a step back and say, what do I treat with? What's the timing of that treatment? How does that physically relate back? Does that product choice relate back to the physical insect and to the biology of the insect? So first off is product choice. When I'm thinking about product choice, I'm thinking, will that insecticide actually get to, to where the insect is damaging? So in some cases, like with hard scales that feed not on the uh, phloem bundle, but actually feed on the individual cells, uh, some systemic insecticides won't work, like uh, imidacloprid, which is our branded Zytec product, won't actually work because it does not translocate within the leaf. So that's my first question. Is, it going, is the product actually going to get to where the insect is? Will it actually impact the insect? Some really nice products don't have uh, much effect on scale insects. So amectin benzoate is always a really poor choice for scale insects just because it, it doesn't work very well against them. Uh, my second question is, how does the insect decide to move throughout the tree, if it moves throughout the tree? Uh, if I'm doing a spray, will it, physically will it physically hit everything it needs to hit? Will I get full coverage? Um, if I am not able to, do full, to get full coverage, will I need multiple applications of that insecticide? If I'm doing a systemic, how long does it take for that systemic to get into the tree, to get to where it needs to get to? to hit the specific pest. And then there's the timing issue. Uh, scales are a weird insect because they're very difficult to control because not all life stages are susceptible to a particular insecticide. Um, I'm talking specifically for scale insects about the adult life stages and some of the egg life stages. Really, uh, the only life stage that is susceptible to most insecticides is the crawler life stage. That's the nymphal stage. That's when um, the physical insects, the immature insects, are moving about and feeding. And that, you really need the insecticide to be in the tree or on the tree in time to target that crawler life stage. Uh, another question I have is, will that insecticide come in contact with with the actual scale insect. So we've got it there, we've got it at the right time. Um, however, as I said before, with uh, products like imidacloprid, it might actually just not ever see and not ever run into the, the crawler stage of the scale because it's feeding off of a different part of the tree. Another example of this is, uh, and one I'll, I will get to the end of the presentation, are scale insects that exclusively feed on the bark of, a, of the tree. Um, those, those insects won't ever come into contact with systemic insecticides. So that's when we have to take a look at a different tool in the toolbox and a different approach. And then the final question I have when taking a look at what product to choose um, once we've made that, yes, I need to manage the scale decision, is how long will the product remain in the tree? So product acephate, which is our Levitech product, will only have about a 30-day residual. Um, some of the sprays, the permethrin sprays, uh, specifically our branded TenGuard, will only have about a 10 to 15 day residual on the tree. So you may need to spray multiple times if you opt in for the spray option. And I'll go over all of these and all of uh, our recommendations and how we came to them, as well as a little bit about the life cycle of each scale that we'll go over. But in terms of control strategies, there are really two main ones that we'll be talking about today. There's the contact insecticide which include trunk and limb sprays and physical canopy sprays. Um, so horticultural oil and permethrin are the two that I'll be going over today. And then the other uh, control strategy is systemic insecticides, which I'll talk about on the next slide. Uh, horticulture oil is really great because it's highly selective. Um, it doesn't actually work as a contact insecticide, but what it really does is it smothers the, the sphere, spiracles, which are the airway holes, basically, um, and basically knocks out their uh, oxygen getting system. And by doing that, it really selectively targets scale insects and other insects that are around in the nymphal stage during this time. If you spray in March or in November, um, you, get, you have the option of hitting just the nymphal stage um, as it prepares to overwinter or is coming out of that overwintering time period. Um, with permethrin, that's another really good option as a contact insecticide that usually has about a two weeks of residual 
uh, weather permitting. With both of these, if it rains immediately after or rains during the time, um, or with permethrin, if it rains during that two-week residual, usually that insecticide will wash right off. Um, however, permethrin is a contact insecticide. So when it hits the crawlers, um, and when it hits the crawlers, it, it will knock them down. Uh, additionally, you really have to be careful to spray only when the crawlers are present. Uh, some limitations with this is really targeting area. As you can see over here, this person is wearing proper PPE. He's spraying the entire tree. He's trying to get as, as good coverage as possible. However, these insects are very, very small and have a great, great reproduction capability. So you may not actually be able to hit, knock out the entirety of the population using just this contact insecticide strategy. Uh, the other strategy that we recommend are sy systemic insecticides. Um, over here we have Dinoteflon, and which is our branded Transtec product, and Imidacloprid, which is our branded Zytec product. Uh, both of these can be soil applied um, or physically injected into the tree or bark sprayed into the, into the tree. And each have their own uptake time um, and their own longevity scale. Uh, with Transtec, when, when you soil apply it, it takes one to two weeks for uptake which means that you, about two weeks prior to when the season starts, you have to be thinking about applying Transtec. And the season starts when crawlers are present. So about two weeks prior to when crawlers are present is really when you need to target hitting those crawler stages. However, with systemic insecticides, you have a little bit more of a window. Um, you can actually apply either of these two uh, well before that, um, as long as you're trying not to hit uh, when flowers are present and when pollinators are going to those flowers. Um, you can really apply these insecticides well before that, and since they do have season longevity, that's really, they stop being effective about two weeks prior to when that season starts. Um, and then for a trend stick, you can also bark spray it. And I find this is a, actually an easier application to do, an easier application to just get on site, bark spray, and then you're done. There's less labor associated with that application as well. And also bark spray can be a just-in-time solution. Um, so for Transdict, it only takes about two to three days for uptake of bark sprays. And when you're targeting that, as soon as you see crawlers out, you should be going to every site that you need to spray, or right before when you believe crawlers will be out. Uh, you should be going right before and applying a bark spray. Uh, for Transdict, there is less labor for these systemic insecticides. Um, they're also less selective. So if you've got a really sensitive client that is worried about bee issues and is worried about hitting other non-target insecticides, um, we really want to be careful because this is a less selective insecticide and it will knock multiple multiple species down. Um, with Transtec, it does have a four to six month activity um, rather than season long activity. So it's, it is really good for scale insects and managing those multiple emergences in the hard scales. Uh, with imidacloprid, it can be uh, soil applied or injected. When you soil apply imidacloprid, which is our Zytec branded product, it takes about four to six weeks for uptake. Um, so we really should be thinking about doing the soil application either well before or up to four weeks prior to when those crawlers are present. Because if you see the crawlers and crawlers are only out for about a month and a half, and you, you say, okay, it's time, let me do a soil application. The day that these crawlers are out, I see them, we're ready. Uh, this product will actually stay in the root zone from four to six weeks. So it really won't be helpful, and it won't be attacking the right, the right stage of insect. Um, and by the time it gets into this tree, uh, those crawlers may not actually be available. An alternative to that, though, is actually injecting with imidacloprid. And we've done some ELISA assays where we physically took leaf samples of the upper canopy and saw how quickly this insecticide gets into the canopy, and it's almost instantaneous. It's within one day that the, insect, that the insecticide will physically get into the canopy. And that's with the caveat that the vascular system is intact and a couple, and weather, um, that weather dictates really fast uptake. Um, but if you also need another good just-in-time solution, Injecting with imidacloprid will work at, at crawler onset will work really, really well. 
and these systemic insecticides, because you only have to be on the site once for the entire season, really require less labor. Um, they, this one, the Zytac product, really has season-long efficacy. Um, however, you do have to be a little bit careful because that product is less selective. So if you do have a homeowner um, or a client that is a little bit more worried about bee issues or is a little bit more worried about hitting non-target non insects, you might want to stick to some of the other more targeted sprays. Um, so I went over this a little bit last, a little bit on the last couple slides. Um, but with Transdect, uh, we can apply as late as one to two weeks prior to crawlers, but you may apply much sooner. Um, the Transdect as a bark spray can be a just-in-time solution, and it does have that almost season-long duration, so a four to six month duration in the tree. With Zytec as a soil applied, you can apply as late as four to six weeks. As an injection, you can apply up to when, um, up to when those crawlers are seen, and it is a year-long solution. With Tengard, which is our branded uh, permethrin spray, you, can, you really need to check when those crawlers are present. And because it only has a 14-day residual, you may need multiple sprays to hit multiple stages of those crawlers. Um, and then for Lepitect, which is a product, which is an acetate-based product, um, this one really only applies to European elm scales, and I'll go over a life cycle later with everyone here. Um, but Lepitect's a lot faster as a soil applied. Um, it actually gets into the tree in about, and usually less than two weeks, so usually within a one week. So up to one week prior, you need to apply that Lepitect product. Um, but it only has a 30-day duration. So if you're doing soil applied acephate, be, be super worried about when those crawlers are present and if you need to do a follow-up spray or a combination treatment. Um, so why do, why do these uh, different products have different uptake speeds? Well, it has to do with how soluble the physical molecule is. Um, we did some of that ELISA work. We did some of that study to try and quantify how much product is in the tree over what, what amount of time. So, with, and these are both soil applied, but with soil applied transdect, within seven days, that product is within the, is within the leaf tissue at a high quantity because it is so water soluble. Whereas Zytect, though it's, it slowly ramps up in efficacy and slowly ramps up in uh, the amount of product within the leaf tissue. Now, I do have to note that as a science person over here, there are different thresholds. Um, for targeting different insects, so both are effective um, when targeted against uh, uh, against specific insects, and usually effective after that 30-day mark for Zytec. But I did want to point out how much physical grams of product, or nanograms in this case, of active gets into the leaf tissue over what time period. Um, so just an overview control strategy um, for different types of scales. I, I do want to stress over here that with scale insects, multiple uh, control strategies may be necessary. So for soft scales, if you're going with a, a, a spray, you can apply horticulture oil um, either in late fall before winter hits or early spring with a permethrin or just do a permethrin uh, contact spray. Uh, as, as soon as the crawlers are out. Um, since soft scales only have one crawler stage, you usually only need to hit that onset a couple, uh, only need to hit that onset once. However, the crawlers may emerge over the course of more than a month, which is when you need to spray with permethrin a couple of times. Um, with soft scales, you can generally use uh, Zytect or Transdect or, or an injection of Zytect or bark spray of Transdect. Uh, depending what your company uses and what labor um, they want associated with that use. With armored scales, um, because Zytec only travels through the vascular system, Zytec will not hit armored scales whatsoever. Um, so what you can do is do that winter horticulture oil spray. Uh, you can do that, try and contact with permethrin and horticulture spray. And we're using hort oil in this case as just an adjuvant to help uh, penetration to the leaf, um, but, but you really have to try and hit that crawler stage when it's present or else um, 
really the adults are not susceptible to permethrin. Um, additionally, you could do a soil application of Transtect um, or a bark spray application of Transtect. And I'm actually going to walk you through a couple different specific scales. And keep in mind that the strategies that I just talked about, I will have generalized life cycles um, for you. Um, ready to go. So with the soft scales, we'll be talking about magnolia scale, cottony maple scale, mechanium scale, European elm scale, and wax scale. And then with armored scales, we're going to be talking about elongated helmlock scale, pine needle scale, euonymus scale, white prinicola scale, oyster shell scale, and obscure scale. So magnolia scale. You can see that over on the right side, now these are a fairly sizable scale. They're up to an eighth of an inch um, or up to a fourth of an inch in diameter. You can see next to the person's finger how large they are. So your, your homeowner may actually notice these scales physically on the bark. Uh, their, their hosts are magnolia trees, but really any type of magnolia tree. So star magnolias, cucumber magnolias, saucer, or lily magnolia trees. Um, in terms of feeding damage, the crawlers and adults will cause feeding damage. Um, it can physically injure or kill the tree. It will reduce the foliage potentially with high infestation levels. Um, it may reduce flower production, which is why pe many people plant magnolia trees. Um, it could cause potentially twig or branch dieback. And because these are a soft scale, as we talked about before, it, it will produce honeydew, which will produce sooty mold, which can bring in nuisance insects and can cause issues on different, different furniture and patios. Now, I created some of these documents to try and explain when is the right time to spray and when is the right time to apply the different insecticides. Um, with magnolia scales, there, or with magnolia trees, because the flowers are well visited by pollinators, we really have to be wary of some pollinator issues. Um, however, since the scales occur highly, really late in the season and the flowers generally do not last that late, uh, I wouldn't be too worried about using these insecticides with the exception of Zytec, which will last one year and potentially hit the flowers the following year. Um, this is a generalized life cycle. It's based on uh, 2,000 growing degree days for crawler emergence. Um, it's also based on uh, East Coast life cycle times. Um, so really just adjust this scale to when, or this chart over here to when those scales are present. Uh, in the yellow, you can see that on the East Coast anyway, um, these scales, the crawlers are physically emerging and crawling for about um, one and three-fourths months. So from uh, beginning of September all the way through and including October is when these crawlers are present. Um, if you really want to use a spray option, um, we just really have to be worried about when is the optimal time to spray. These, do, these insects do overwinter as nymphs, um, so you can do a, a horticulture oil spray um, during November to December or during February to March. Um, during the November to December time frame, you really want 48 hours of continuous temperatures below freezing because that will push the insects into a not moving stage and actually set them on the path of overwintering. However, during those below freezing temps, you really are cautious about using your equipment during that time because your equipment has the possibility of freezing. Um, so you do want that 48 hours of continuous temperatures below freezing. However, you want a day after that time, um, sometime in the November to December time frame, where it is about 40 to 45 degrees Fahrenheit that day. And then once again, the same type of thing occurs in February, where if, you're, if you want to go horticulture oil or horticulture oil in a combination treatment, um, you really want to hit before bud break. So this is after the winter happens, so there have been about at least 48 hours of continuous temps below freezing, but you don't want these dormant insects to be completely woken up. Um, you really want them to be in that life stage of crawlers, of uh, nymphs, which are susceptible. So you do want um, it to be close enough to, to freezing, but not actually freezing so that these nymphs haven't awoken. Um, so you really do want to hit before leaf bud break, 
on a 40 to 45 degree Fahrenheit day. Um, there is a little bit of flexibility here, and we showed that within this chart. So the other option for spray technology here is using TenGuard, which is our permethrin branded product. And actually, TenGuard can be sprayed and probably should be sprayed multiple times because crawlers are continually emerging throughout the early September to late October stage. Um, so you should be spraying with TenGuard if that's your option or if that's one of your combination options throughout the entire season. Um, with Transtect, uh, which is our Dinoteflon product, uh, we want to take a look to uh, either inject or soil apply this product about two weeks before um, to about the middle because it does have two-week uptake. You, you can go as late as about two weeks prior to when the crawlers are no longer present, so you do have that flexibility. Um, you do want to be a little bit worried about uh, applying too early here because when flowers are present, we may have some non-target effects with some of the pollinators, and that's our particularly of an issue on magnolia trees. Um, however, because of that, because of that particular pollinator issue, um, on magnolia scale, we don't actually recommend treating with Zytec anymore. Um, so instead, we're going to recommend treating with acephate, which has about a week-long uptake. So about a week prior to when those crawlers are expected to be present, um, you can treat with acephate to knock that out. However, acephate only works for a month. It only lasts 30 days within the tree. So you have to be really careful of potentially following up with a, a 10 guard application or following up with a, an application of a different contact insecticide uh, to really knock down that crawler stage for following years. And I wanted to spend a lot of time on that life cycle chart just to understand how the biology of that particular scale, and actually the biology of all scales, relates to the different management techniques. Um, so for cottony maple scale, that's the next uh, insect that I'm going to be going over, it really has a wide range of hosts. Uh, it really hits silver maples hard, but all maples. It hits honey locusts, uh, linden trees, as well as multiple other hardwoods. You could recognize it from the adults from that really uh, cottony show over here. So if you would take a look at the right, those are fairly large scale insects and produce that fairly large cottony looking wax. Um, they are white and brown. Uh, their adult stages are not very mobile, though they can be mobile and the adult stages exist mostly on the bark. However, the crawlers do feed on the leaf tissue. Um, these ones uh, are a physical eyesore, so many people might, many uh, homeowners might see these and say, hey, look, I've got this issue, we have to treat immediately. But once you see this uh, adult stage, it may be too late to treat. Um, they do produce large amounts of honeydew. Uh, they can produce leaf yellowing or premature foliage drop. Um, another thing to note with scale insects is even if you do spray them in time, um, you knock the adults. The adults are dead. The crawlers never become adults. They may not actually <laughs> leave the bark or the physical plant tissue. They may stay attached um, throughout the current season. So you really have to set that expectation up with the practitioner that these are insects that may continue to be an eyesore. And if that's the only reason to treat them and they're not actually causing that much economic damage, it may you may want to talk your, your homeowner away from treatment as an option. Um, so for cottony maple scales, you can treat with RTSA horticulture oil um, in the November to December time frame as well as before leaf bud break. Um, you really do want to treat with TenGuard, uh, or if you want to use a spray, you can treat with permethrin. Um, you can also use Transtect, as we said before, up to two weeks prior to that crawler emergence. Um, or you could use Lepitect or Acephate um, at crawler emergence. You could also use Zytec, um for this one because it is a soft scale. Um, for Lacanium scale, this is a, a polyphagous eater, which means it eats many, many things. So it's found on many deciduous ornamental trees. Um, you can see to the right what, what this insect looks like. It's, it's relatively large. It sort of has that snail shape going on. And those are the adults. And then you can, if you take a look a little bit closer um, to the image to the right, 
um, you'll see those lighter colored nymphs on the veins of, of the leaf, and those nymphs really cause full-on leaf dieback. Um, with an, enough pressure, with enough physical insects on the tree, um, not only will it produce a lot of honeydew, but it will actually reduce the plant health to the point of stunting and even tree death. Um, so lacanium scales are definitely one to consider treating depending on the, the different population. Um, also, so for European elm scale, it's another insect that I wanted to go over. This is particularly an issue on elms in Denver, where uh, these scale insects, uh, in some cases, have actually become resistant to imidacloprid, uh, which is how, how much of an issue they are because they've been so overly treated um, and cause a lot of economic damage. They mainly attack elm trees, mainly American elms. Um, they do produce a lot of honeydew. When we were out doing a European elm scale trial last, last fall, or last um, summer, they actually made the entire uh, bark of these large, large elm trees covered in black city mold. Um, they do produce leaf yellowing and leaf drop in a almost flagging symptom that's similar to um, Dutch elm disease, but definitely a little bit different. And they do cause potential branch dieback in great numbers. Um, you can tell if they're alive or dead uh, using a squish test, as many practitioners like to call them. So physically taking the scale insect and squishing it between your fingers or onto a piece of paper um, if you prefer that. And if you physically see that uh, red sub substance come out of there, that means those scale insects are alive and well. And you want to do that squish test because they are somewhat unsightly and they do remain on the tree for multiple years even after they've dried out. Um, so they can just remain an eyesore. Um, their nymphs, their crawler stages, are bright yellow. And the crawler stages are active from probably the first week of June into the middle of July. Um, as I said, in some places uh, it's been shown that they are, European elm scales are resistant to imidacloprid, but that's not the case for all places. Um, for horticulture oil, you do want to spray uh, from the November to December time frame, and all, once again in the February to March time frame. You can use Transtect as a soil application up to two weeks prior to the crawler emergence, um, or as a bark spray from the day the crawlers emerge going forward. And that does last in the tree for at least four to six weeks, or for at least four to six months, sorry. Um, and then for this one, we also recommend using uh, Lapitect. And this is something that Whitney Cranshaw has done much work on to show that Lapitect or Asaphate um, is a really good solution to European elm scale. And there's the soil timing versus the injection timing you can see over there. And then also, uh, as with, with any insect, um, when, you're play, when you're spraying with Tengard with the permethrin product, uh, you really want to spray at crawler onset. And you potentially need multiple sprays to get that particular job um, completed, or multiple strategies, where if you start with a soil applied acephate about a week before prior to crawler onset, you can follow up with a spray as soon as that product runs out. Another scale I wanted to talk about over here was a wax scale. It has over 50 different host plants, including Japanese and Chinese hollies, uh, spirella, uh, hemlock plants, and euonymus plants. Um, it is a bizarre looking insect that's sort of bulbous and purple. Um, and you do see them on the plant well after uh, the insect is, is gone. So you, uh, squish test is actually helpful to determine whether the insect pressure is very high or not high at all. Uh, they do cause some major um, weakening of the plant, which can cause decline. However, the main issue with wax scale is the honeydew. They are prolific, prolific honeydew producers. Um, so just to show why different insecticides work um, at different types of scales, uh, there was a test done by Dr. Cliff Stavadoff and Dr. Jonathan Neal down at the University of Purdue trying to figure out where these scales feed, where do these crawlers physically feed on the plant. Um, so they took a look at 
uh, uh, this one hard scale. This was um, a euonymus hard scale. And they found that on the leaf tissue, on the petiole tissue, and on the stem tissue, these scales barely even touched the xylem, the bundle shaft, the upper epidermis, and the phloem. They were really uh, penetrating the cells and having the stylets penetrate through the cells, the epidermis, the lower ep epidermis, the spongy mesophyll, and the palisade layer. That means that they're really ignoring the entire vascular system, which is why soft scales produce honeydew, and they're really just targeting these outward parts of the leaf tissue over here. And though, though this hasn't been shown for every single type of hard scale, um, it was definitively shown in euonymus scales. And because of that, we really have to take a look at what insecticides to use that really don't travel um, exclusively in the xylem and phloem. So in this case, metaclobrid just doesn't translocate that well. Um, and in addition, uh, the acivate product just does not translocate that well. So in terms of systemic product, products, you really have to take a look at our transtech product, which is much more soluble and does get to these places that these scale insects hit. Uh, for hemlock, elongated hemlock scale, this is hemlocks and firs and spruce trees are the major issue over here. Um, this is a hard scale or an armored scale, and every scale insect going forward will be an armored scale. Um, they will cause excessive loss of plant fluids. It will reduce the growth and the health of the plant. Um, what you'll physically see is a yellow needle banding or on the bottom of these, uh, of these leaves or of these um, needles, you will see the hard scale, so almost looking like speckled white dots. These are very, very small scale insects, um, so you may not recognize them on low densities. Uh, they do lead to premature needle drop and thinning crown, um, and they are generally found with, or actually in many areas, they're found with hemlock lily adelgid, which is something that you definitely should treat for, because that's a, a major invasive right now. Um, or it's, yeah, it is a major invasive spreading through uh, most of the East Coast and coming over West right now. Um, so in terms of when do we treat it? And what do we treat with? Well, we're a little bit, little bit more limited on products that we can treat. Uh, the crawlers do uh, emerge uh, around 272 growing degree days, and then again at 1350 growing degree days. Um, you can plot your own growing degree day charts. Uh, these numbers are, you can adjust these numbers based on what's actually happening in your area. There are a couple really good online tools to do that. Um, we really can't use Zytact or Lepitact for this, for this type of scale insect, um, just because it's not feeding in the places that these insecticides go to. So really, we really have to rely a little bit more on sprays, and then once again on that systemic insecticide. So treating with Transtact about two weeks prior, or doing a bark spray as soon as you see crawlers emerge, um, or treating with, with a ten guard uh, multiple times during the two emergences to really knock down that population. Um, also with hemlock trees, I do have to note that these trees are very, very large, so getting accurate um, and full coverage on all the nymphs may not be possible. Another major pest is pine needle scale, uh, which is hosted by the mungo and scotch pines, but does hit other pine trees. Um, it once again looks like that speckling on the underside of needles and could be yellow banding um, on needles. It causes needle chlorosis and premature needle drop um, and does reduce plant vitality and potentially die back over here. Uh, once again, the timeline to hit pine needle scale is based ex exclusively on when cra crawlers are available. If you do use a hort oil, um, I should note that that shouldn't be the only tool that you use. You should follow up with a knockdown when crawlers are present because it's likely that you'll miss uh, some of these crawlers when you're doing that initial dormant oil spray. Um, however, Transtect is a really good product, and Tengard, if you do multiple applications for a crawler stage, is a really good product for that as well. Uh, we took a look at Transtect efficacy a while back, and we wanted to see, does this really work on pine needle scale? So we were, I think we were here in Minnesota, where we were treating around, uh, we applied Transtect on May 15th, 2008, 
um, at that rate. Um, and we were controlling percent mortality of the NIMPS, simple NSTARS, compared on the control versus transect. And transect actually got, as a systemic, uh, greater than 90% efficacy, so then greater than 90% mortality. So really knocking down that population compared to just under 10% mortality with doing a controlled treatment. Um, and then we also took a look at the number of adult females left on those on those physical pine needles. And transdect, we could not find any adult females left on those needles versus almost 126, so almost 130 um, adult females left on the controls. And keep in mind, each female produces up to 100 eggs per female um, per season. So that, that's a pretty, pretty extensive exponential population boom that you're preventing for the following year when you treat with a systemic insecticide. Uh, another major pest that we want to talk about today is euonymus scale. Euonymus scale uh, do attack multiple types of holly trees. Um, once again, they remove fluid from non-vascular cells, so you'll see that uh, speckling effect. Um, they do reduce plant health and cause uh, stifling on foliage, um, defoliation, and dieback. And they can ramp up populations pretty effectively. Um, so you potentially want to treat preventatively with that horticulture oil. Um, not sure why Zytec's on here. Uh, I, I don't think Zytec works on Euonymus scale, but I will, I'll double check over here. Um, but uh, Transtech definitely works on it, and TenGuard uh, absolutely is an effective management tool. Uh, another hard scale that we'll be talking about today is white criticola scale. Now this hits many, many flowering trees, and the adults actually mainly reside on the bark and the, and the larger branches and trunk of the tree. Um, this host uh, for this insect include peach trees, plum trees, cherry trees, mulberry trees, lilac trees, and even privets. Um, it does cause some major branch dieback, and as you can see um, to the right, as Brian Krunkel's uh, picture shows, this cause, can cause some pretty, pretty awful aesthetic damage on the tree and think about the type of fluid or the quantity of fluid that is being pulled out of that tree. Um, in fact, uh, complete plant mortality has been seen from white pernicola scale. Uh, so when, when do we treat for these? Well, the, like most other armored scales, there are multiple different crawler emergences. And although only about 100 nymphs emerge from each or 100 eggs are laid, and emerged from each of these uh, adults, it still is a, a large amount um, of crawlers that emerge each year. So you can you can spray with Darwin oil in November, and then again February or November or February. Um, alternatively, you can do season-wide multiple applications of Tengar to keep that population in control. Um, keep in mind, you really have to hit that targeted crawler stage, but they're, they are emerging through most of the season. Um, uh, alternatively, uh, you can spray or you can uh, apply with Transtect as a soil application um, about two weeks prior to initial crawler emergence, which would be in about mid-March. Um, or you could do a bark spray as soon as crawlers emerge that will provide that season-long efficacy and knock down the populations for future years. Um, another major armored scale that I'd like to talk about is oyster shell scale. Um, it's a polyphagous uh, insect, which means it has multiple, multiple food sources, including ash, aspen, um, cottonese deer, poplars, willows, willows, and lilac. Um, it does cause that feeding damage on larger branches and trunks. Um, can cause limb dieback or complete mortality. But this one is particularly, uh, it increases plant pathogen susceptibility. And then another scale that I'd like to cover is obscure scale. Obscure scale is, has a wide geographic range. Um, it does attack dogwoods, hackberries, hickories, maple trees, and oak trees. Um, it does cause sort of the same feeding damage as the scale insect I just talked about. Um, and it, it feeds on larger branches and trunks. Uh, it does cause that branch and limb dieback or complete mortality. Uh, it does increase that path, plant pathogen susceptibility. And as you'll notice with obscure scale, and as the title uh, indicates, it's very hard to see on plants. So that, 
that's another major reason why the scale uh, can ramp up population very, very quickly, is many people cannot see the scale and because it blends in so well with the bark of these trees. I did want to talk a little bit about why treatments fail and sort of relate that back to the biology of the different types of insects. Well, it could have to do with the life cycle. Um, if the pesticide is not in sync with the life cycle or the pesticide um, doesn't last the entirety or isn't reapplied um, for the entirety time um, of when the susceptible life cycle stage is present, um, the treatment may fail due to, due to simple life cycle timing. And this is particularly important for non-systemic bird contact ones um, or for systemic sprays um, or systemic applied uh, products. If you miss the life cycle timing, if you don't apply those products when the crawlers are active so that they'll be in the tree for when the crawlers are active, um, the treatments may not be effective whatsoever. Um, also, population establishment. As I've noted before, these populations ramp up very, very quickly. So it may take multiple years to get that population into control. And it may take multiple uh, different application types to try and knock it down a couple of times to get it into a controllable cycle where you only have to use one type of uh, product and one type of insecticide to keep the insect under control. Um, another issue we have mainly with sprays is coverage. Or if you don't get that full bark and limb um, pesticide spray, then or you don't get that full canopy coverage, um, then you may be missing major, major pockets of insects. And as we saw with some of the obscure, with the obscure scale, some of the other ones, these scales are fairly hard to spot in some of the larger, um, larger trees. Another issue is incorrect pesticide selection. So if we select a pesticide that doesn't actually hit this insecticide family or this insect family, uh, like an MMF menzoate for its scale insect, generally speaking, that does not work and is not effective. Um, we really have to see that as another reason why the treatment may fail. And then the final reason that I'm putting forward is weather. So if you if you spray a product and then it rains the next day or it rains within 48 hours um, or within a high wind and the product doesn't effectively hit the plant, um, then it can cause irregular weather effects um, due to timing of treatment um, based on those weather events. And those are hard to predict um, and either even harder to comply with, but that is another reason why treatments fail. And then the final thing I wanted to go over was bark feeding armored scales. Now, armored scales are already less susceptible to insecticides due to where they feed, um, but they're they're different uh, uh, different uh, sp feeding strategies. Um, where obscure scales, when they don't actually feed um, on the tree, and where they don't actually feed on where the insecticide can go. So, um, when the adults are only feeding and the crawlers are exclusively feeding um, on the bark of the tree. Uh, those insecticides may not actually get to where the where the insect can hit them. So in that case, we can only really recommend crawler stage sprays as well as horticulture dormant oils uh, sprays um, to try and knock down that crawler stage um, as much as possible. Well, that's the end of my talk. I do want to remind everyone about some upcoming webinars that we have. Um, we have a Recruiting and Finding Talent webinar by Jason, a Soil of Applied Insecticides, one by Sean Burnick coming up. And I think those are the two uh, next webinars uh, coming up. I um, want to thank you for your listening. And uh, f please, and yeah, please feel, to, feel free to contact me and follow up after the webinar. Um, here's my email and um, my phone number. So thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Any questions?